Hey everyone, I'm Sarah, this is Susan, and this is Ben, and we're the Kornick family. Uh, today we're really excited because we get to share and read aloud A Good Kind of Trouble with all of you. Uh, and this book is really special to us. Um, it's by Lisa Moore Ramey. Uh, and uh, Lisa has always had a really fond uh, passion and love for both reading and writing. Um, you know, growing up when Lisa wasn't reading, she was in her room pretending. Um, she always pictured herself in the stories that she read. Um, she would practice fan drama, she would write fan fiction, um, and created complicated further adventures of her favorite characters and always planted herself in the midst of it all. Um, this book that we'll be reading, A Good Kind of Trouble, um, is about a young girl struggling to figure out how race has impacted her life. Um, as a black girl going to predominantly white schools, Lisa had similar questions growing up. She, although A Good Kind of Trouble isn't autobiographical, it does capture some of the confusion and questions that Lisa had um, about friendship, about romance, about race at that time. Um, Lisa's originally from Los Angeles, California, but she now lives in the Bay Area up here with all of us. Um, and she lives here with her husband, her two kids, her two cats. Uh, and she always says she has more yard than she can control. <laughs> um, so with that being said, we'll start a good kind of trouble for you guys. Uh, we're going to read a few chapters in hopes that you guys get hooked just like we did uh, and hope to continue reading on uh, and, and learn about the story that Lisa wrote for us. Um, so let's begin. Uh, chapter one of A Good Kind of Trouble called First Slide. I'm allergic to trouble. It makes my hands itch. But today in science, when Mr. Levy starts calling out a lab partner assignments, I don't even get the slightest tingle. I just sit there, barely breathing waiting for him to assign me the perfect partner. He's been promising we'd start science lab since the first day of school, but it's been weeks. Lots of time for me to decide on the perfect partner. Mr. Levy has been teaching science at Emerson Junior High for centuries, and he looks like a mad scientist, for real. He has wild, frizzy, gray hair, and he even wears a lab coat every day. He fluffs, fluffs his hair and adjusts his thick black glasses and I start rubbing my hands against my legs, which isn't a good sign, but I don't pay any attention. Any second, he will get to my name. Shayla and Mr. Levy pauses for a few seconds, like he's really thinking about it, like he doesn't already have the list in front of him. And Bernard, he says, no, and I mean no. This is the opposite of perfect. I sneak a peek behind me. Bernard just sits in the back, slouching low in his seat. Junior high desks weren't made for Bernard. He's not kid-sized, he's grown-up sized, and grown-up big. He catches me looking at him, and his mouth shifts into a mean grimace. I gulp and look away. My sister Hannah would say, I'm just being like those people who take one look at a black person and think they need to clutch their purse tight or lock their car doors. I have no problem with Bernard being black. Obviously, I'm black too. It's him being huge, mean, and scary. Bernard went to the same elementary school as me and my best friends, Isabella and Julia. We're all terrified of him. Everyone I know is terrified of him. Even in kindergarten, he would scowl at everybody and he'd yell a lot. In second grade, he yelled at me because I got to the Star Wars Legos before he did. He grabbed those stormtroopers right out of my hands and if you've ever had someone snatch Legos from you, you know how much it hurts. And he didn't say sorry. I told him I needed the stormtroopers, but Bernard looked at me like he would have mind, wouldn't have minded squashing me right underneath one of his big shoes. Bernard was a bully then, and he's a bully now. Please, oh please, don't let us be doing lab work today. Find your partners, everyone, Mr. Levy claps his hands together. I just bet partnering me with Bernard is some devious experiment. What happens if we mix trouble-hating girl with bully boy? Kaboom, that's what. Shayla, Bernard hollers. He sounds mad. I guess he's not happy that we're partners either. I walk to the back of the room to the lab tables and my feet feel like they weigh 600 pounds. I got the first slide, Bernard's voice is like a, punch, a bunch of bowling balls being dropped at the same time. The glass in one of them and one of his big paws snaps in two. Oh, I say, he could probably snap one of my fingers just like that. Bernard shakes his hand and starts sucking a finger. I'm sure that's a bad idea. Mr. Levy comes over and sets some new slides next to our microscope. 
He doesn't even ask Bernard if he's okay. Bernard doesn't look okay. He looks angry, which is basically saying he looks like Bernard. Stop messing around, Mr. Levy yells at Bernard. I wasn't, Bernard booms. Mr. Levy shakes his head and walks away. After that, Bernard won't even look in the microscope. He shoves a slack of slides at me like it's my fault he broke the first one. The top slide has a greeny, a tiny green brown thing on it. And when I peer through the microscope, I can see it's a big, a, a bug leg. I think it's from a grasshopper. And I wrote some notes about it, trying not to study Bernard. I don't know if I should say anything to him. I don't know. I don't wanna make him even more mad. When class is over, he gets up so fast, he knocks his desk to its side. And instead of picking it up, he storms out of the room. You bet Mr. Levy frowns real hard at that. I pick up Bernard's desk before leaving class. Maybe since Mr. Levy didn't have to pick it up, no one will get in trouble, but my hands itch anyways. Chapter two, Triangle Friends. We have a break right after second period, and it's the first time of the day when I can meet up with Isabella and Julia. When we get our schedules on May's day, we couldn't believe out of the six classes, we didn't have one together. How is it that e even possible? I'm only in pre-algebra, but I'm pretty sure the odds are that the other, odds are of that have got to be crazy high. Only getting to see my friends at break and lunch is worst. Some people think it's weird I have two best friends, but who's your favorite, they'll ask. Who would pick between pizza and spaghetti? They're both the best. We make a great triangle, and the three is actually a magic number. I learned it from the Schoolhouse Rock DVDs. We're alike in everything that matters. We call ourselves the United Nations because Isabel is Puerto Rican and Julia is Japanese American. And then there's me. And yes, we know black isn't a nation, but we also know we are united. We've been friends since forever, but super best friends since third grade when we got partnered for a group project. Each group was assigned a place in the world and then had to give a presentation like, it was, like we were tour guides. We got Hawaii and mama bought fake palm trees and coconuts from Dollar Tree and Isabel's mom, who's a graphic designer, helped us make travel brochures. Isabel painted an amazing poster of a Hawaiian beach at sunset. Julia is really excited because she has a lot of family living in Hawaii. She bought, brought in a whole bunch of shell necklaces and postcards and even a bottle full of sand from a Hawaiian beach. We've been united ever since. Every day at break, we meet behind a row of extra classrooms next to the multi-purpose room. Even though the buildings are called portables, I don't think they ever get moved once they're set down. Isabella is already there claiming our spot right under a huge magnolia tree, but there's no sign of Julia yet. Isabel's t-shirt is a swip, swirl of peach and rose with a hint of pale blue. It looks like a dawn sky. It's beautiful and I'm immediately jealous. That is the cutest top is, I say, when did you get it? Isabel looks down at herself as if she can't remember what she's wearing. It's just a tie dye. She stretches the material out, examining the colors. I was trying for a sort of ombre thing. It didn't work exactly. You made it? I'm as close to squealing as I get. She shrugs. It was easy. You just have to be careful how you tie the rubber bands. Well, next time you, we do a tie-dye project, you're totally making mine, I say. You got it, Isabella says with a smile. Where's Julia, I ask. I can't wait to share my horrible science lab news, but I can't say anything until it's the three of us. Isabel points, and I turn to see Julia running towards us. When she reaches us, she's all out of breath and plops down next to me and Isabella. She digs an apple out of her backpack. Sorry I'm late. Mr. Lee took forever handing back homework. What did you get? I ask. And Julia frowns at me. Grades aren't her thing the way they are mine. I mean, she does fine. She just doesn't care. We all stretch out our legs, my long, skinny, dark brown ones next to Isabel's tan ones next to Julia's much lighter ones. We're all wearing low top black converse. Julia's are really worn out and Isabel's are splotched with purple paint. Mine look like they just came out of the box. I like things neat. Since break is only 12 minutes, we don't have time to waste and we're already starting late. So I blurt out, 
You'll never guess who my lab partner is. It's funny how even terrible news can be exciting to tell. Not that jerk who talked about your forehead, Juliet asks and takes a huge bite out of her apple. I put a hand over my forehead. On the very first day in my very first class, there he was, Jace Hayward, with his cinnamon skin just that's just a little lighter than mine, and those wide lime green eyes, and a grin as cool as lake water. I had told Julia and Isabella that this was the year I was going to have a boyfriend, and when I saw Jace, I decided he was the one. If we had gotten partner today, that would have been the first step. I probably should have, shouldn't have, shouldn't have told Julia and Isabel what Jake's said about my forehead. Jace is not a jerk, I say. He was just being funny, although it didn't feel very funny at the time. He called me Jimmy Neutron, and if you've ever seen that old movie, you know calling me that wasn't any kind of compliment. Jay said it pretty loud and it made me feel like I swallowed a piece of coal while I was burn it while it was burning. It's true, I have really big forehead. That there is exactly four inches of space between my eyebrows and my hairline. I know it's four inches because I measured it one day after hearing someone call me five head. If you don't think four inches is a lot, go get a ruler and measure your own forehead. I bet you get a two, possibly a three. If you hit a four, hey, I feel you, but I am more than my forehead. Jake just needs to find that out. Isabella holds up her fist like she might punch somebody. If he's mean to you again, we'll get him. She tightens her lips over her braces, trying to look tough, but she looks ridiculous. Isabella doesn't have a tough bone in her body. Thanks, Iz, I say. I'll definitely knock on your door if someone messes with me. Uh, that makes me think of Bernard. He broke those slides like they were nothing. I hate when people are mean, Isabella says, and she grabs some of my baby carrots. He wasn't being mean, is, Julia says and laughs. He was just being funny. Know what I'm saying? Of course we know what you're saying, Jules, I say, nudging her with my shoulder. She raises her eyebrow at me. You're not supposed to say that. Yeah, say that after. Say what, I ask. When someone says, know what I'm saying? It's not like a real question, Julia explains. It's an expression. Isabella taps me with a carrot. Are you going to tell us who your lab partner is or not? She asks. Bernard, I make my voice go really low. He went off in class today, breaking stuff and knocking his desk over. You have to change lab partners, Isabella squeals. I know, I say, eyes widening. Well, you're doomed, Julia says, matter of fact, like she's already made, uh, ready for my funeral. Real helpful, Jules, Isabella says, shaking her head at Julia, then looks at me. Maybe Mr. Levy will change uh, partners for each lab. But what if I'm stuck with him, I ask. You said you wanted a boyfriend, Jules said, and then she burst out <laughs> laughing. You are not even close to funny, Jules. Normally, I don't mind Julia's jokes, uh, but Bernard being my boyfriend, that's as funny as lima beans. Isabella points a carrot at me. It'll be okay. He can't kill you right in the middle of class. For some reason, that's not nearly as comforting as I want it to be. And I respond, you have carrots stuck in your braces, I tell her. She puts her hand over her mouth. Uh, that's funny because her big hazel eyes get even wider than normal. Because what, I ask. And then the bell rings and breaks over. Gotta go, Isabella jumps. Her third period is on way on the other side of school, so she always dashes as soon as the bell rings. I won't see you guys at lunch, she yells over her shoulder. I have an appointment, and then she runs off. Wait, what? I call after her, uh, but she doesn't turn back to answer. Did you know she was leaving school early? I asked Julia. Nope, Julia says. Hey, don't worry about Bernard. I hold up my hand so Julia can help me out. Um, and now I have to go to PE, I groan. Julia yanks me up from the ground, and just for a tiny second, I can imagine flying right over the row of portables and far, far away from PE. So that wraps up chapter two. Uh, that's all the time that we have to share with you. Um, but we really do hope that you continue into chapter three and the rest of A Good Kind of Trouble by Lisa Moore Ramey. Uh, thank you for having us and we hope you enjoy. Bye guys. Thank you Bye. so much.